and a welcome to you uh, to the class of ENT once again uh, for the third time this week. Okay, uh, because you're aware that we have very little time left, so we need to go very quickly and we need to cover all the topics that are important for you from clinical point of view as well as from examination point of view. So in the continuum of uh, diseases of uh, nose, today we are going to study about the diseases of nasal septum. Okay, so today we are in a different classroom. So uh, if there is any echo or if there is no clarity in the voice or any problem, then you can tell me. And uh, uh, if required, then I'll make some changes. All right, so we are 50 students now, 50 participants. So we'll begin the class. Okay, so today we are going to talk about roughly, okay, we have already studied about anatomy. So something about anatomy. And then we are going to talk about deviated nasal septum, septal hematoma, septal abscess, and septal perforation. So, okay, these are all the different diseases of nasal septum. Anatomy. Okay, the nasal septum has three parts. Okay, this is a very common question. A question, and uh, in exam, in viva, and everywhere, you frequently ask this question: What are the different parts of nasal septum? Okay. So the different parts are columnar septum, membranous septum, and the septum proper. So what these parts are, we are going to study here. Okay, so this is a diagram that you have already seen, uh, maybe for a couple of times, okay? All of these, okay, including this rostrum sphenoid and all these parts, this is the nasal septum, okay? So the nasal septum begins here and it goes up to here. So I'm sure uh, you can see the arrowhead, okay? This arrowhead, right? So the nasal septum begins here and it goes here. Really? I don't know. Oh, madam, you know the slide did you know? Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, probably uh, it may be the issue with the internet connection of yours. Okay, anyway, uh, thank you for informing. So, the symptom begins here and it goes behind up to here, okay? So, this part is the culminar septum and behind this lies the membranous septum and all of this is the septum proper, okay? So, if you remember well, this culminar septum is formed by the medial cross of the LR, LR cartilage, okay? There are upper lateral cartilage here and the lower lateral cartilage, okay? This is the LR cartilage, okay? The LR cartilage has a lateral cross and the medial cross, lateral cross, medial cross on the both sides, okay? And the medial cross of the both sides, the left and right sides, they come together and then they form the columella, okay? So this columnar part is called the columnar septum. And if you palpate your own nose, Okay, in times of corona or COVID, uh, you shouldn't be taking your fingers into your eyes or nose or anything like that. Okay, anyway, but I'm sure you are at home and you are not. Uh, you have not met with anyone with uh, symptoms, so you are safe and you have been washing your hands so many times in the day. So if you palpate uh, inner column, you can see a thickened part, and just behind that part, okay, there's nothing, and a little more behind, then you can palpate the cartilage. So this part which is devoid of any cartilage and which has only the two skins of both sides joined to each other, that is called membranous septum, all right? So columnar septum formed by the middle cross of the LR cartilage and then the membranous cross, so it has only the skin and then comes the septum proper, okay? The septum proper has two parts, the cartilaginous part and the bony part, okay? This cartilaginous part is also called the quadri uh, quadrilateral cartilage, cartilage, okay? Quadrilateral cartilage, okay? Because it has these four sides and because of its, uh, of its shape, okay? Five parts. And this is the bony part. So superior there is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and inferior there is the bomber bone, okay? And all of this is, uh, helps to form the septum proper. Okay, sometimes uh, in your exam, you may be asked a question like this, okay? Uh, in my Viva exam, in my PC Viva, I was asked this question, okay? What are the minor contributor 
for nasal septum okay or what are the minor contributions of nasal septum so the septum proper doesn't have only these three parts okay these are the major parts and then there are other parts like the rostrum of the sphenoid the crest of palatine bone the crest of maxilla crest of nasal bone nasal spine of frontal bone okay and internal nasal spine of maxilla okay these six parts they are the minor contributors of the nasal septum so if you are asked this question in your theory exam what forms the nasal septum then you need to make a box right the major contributors and the minor contributors in the major contributors the septal cartilage perpendicular pelvic mode and the bomber and in the minor contribution all these parts rostrum sphenoid crest of palatine bone crest of maxilla okay crest of nasal bone and nasal spine of frontal bone and internasal spine of maxilla all right so you can find this thing in jingra too Okay, now let us go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Now this is this image you have already seen earlier. Okay. This is the middle cross and the lateral cross, and this forms the columella. Okay. And this is the middle cross that we are talking about. This is the inner cartilage. Okay, inner cartilage. Now let us go to the diseases of the nasal septum. Okay. The deviated nasal septum. Okay, this is a very common condition, and its short form this is known as DNS. Okay. So, but whenever you are asked to uh, mention it, you always need to mention it in the full form. Deviated nasal septum. Okay. So, what causes deviated nasal septum? So, trauma very commonly any blow on the nose will cause the dislodging of the. Uh, the cartilage the septal cartilage and then it will and then there will be dns similarly developmental cause is also very common especially during birth molding high arch palate unequal growth between skull base and the palate similarly mass in the opposite nasal cavity okay if there is a carcinoma or any nasal polyp or any other benign mass so that will that needs to find out space to grow so it will push the septum to the other side and again, the racial factors, it is more common in Europeans than in Asians or any other people. And it is hereditary, especially in case of posterior DNS. Okay. So the most commonly, you need to mention these two things, the trauma and developmental. Now, what are the different types of DNS? Okay. The interior caudal dislocation, c sept deformity, s sept deformity, septal spur. Okay. By septal spur, what we mean is it is a projection on the nasal septum, a pointed projection on the nasal septum. And similarly, septal thickening, organized hematoma, or overriding of the septal fragments. Okay, and impacted septum despite decongestion. Okay, so okay, we need to learn all these things. Okay, these things is uh, this is clear anterior dislocation, C sept deformity, and the S sept deformity. And septal spur, it means that there is a projection on the nasal septum, a bony like projection. Okay, okay, so that is a misnomer. Okay, because a bone and uh, cartilage that, that can't uh, be there together. And septal thickening, okay, so septal hematoma is a very common condition. Okay, but if it is not treated, or sometimes when the septum has been fragmented, okay, so it has been fractured, and there are multiple frag uh, fragments. And Sometimes one fragment, one small fragment can go, go over the other fragment, and that way it will cause septal thickening. Similarly, when the nasal septum is impacted to the lateral wall, okay, uh, the turbinate or any other structures, the lateral wall, so that is called impacted septum. So in the next few slides, I have some diagrams, okay, that will help you to better understand the conditions. Okay, look here. So this is what we mean by inter-dislocation or the caudal dislocation. So it is congenital and it is also very commonly caused by trauma, okay? So here's the fatty tissue, the muscles and everything has been removed and you can see the bone here and, and this is a real image, okay? And this is the columella and see the caudal part of the septum, it is coming to interiorly. 
So when I'm showing you this, you need to know something clinically. Okay, when you're whenever you're going to do nasal examination, uh, there are multiple steps that you need to complete the nasal examination into. Okay. So one of the steps is vestibular examination, where we just lift the tip of the nose of the patient like this, and the light is being focused to the nose. Okay. That is called the vestibular examination. And after that examination, what we need to do is use a nasal speculum and pass it into, into the nasal cavity so as to make the nasal cavity wider to see inside these structures. Okay. So you may have a question that uh, by the use of nasal speculum with which we can do interrhinoscopy, we can see more structures of the nasal cavity. So what is the need for just lifting the tip and doing the vestibular examination. Okay, the, the importance is, okay, if you do a, if you do vestibular examination in this patient, you can easily see the caudal dislocation of the septum. But if you put a nasal speculum, if you do uh, enterorhinoscope in this patient, then you are going to bypass this deviated area or dislocated area. So you're going to miss this thing. And similarly, uh, in the next class, we'll also talk about epistaxis. So epistaxis is very common from the lesal area, which is present over the anterior inferior part of the nasal septum. So when you put when you put inside the blades of the speculum, so you are going to cover that area or bypass that area, and hence you'll miss uh, interest epistaxis. Okay. So vestibular examination also is important as the interrhinoscopic examination. Okay. Look here. So this is a C-shaped deformity. And here, the deformity is S-shaped. Okay. So this is what I mean by septal spur, okay? This is the di diagrammatic representation of a nasal uh, nose. So we, after you have examined the nose, you need to make a diagram like this. And these are the terminus. Usually you cannot see the superior terminus. So you do not draw that, okay? And these are the middle and the inferior terminus. And here, this is the septal spur, okay? A projection into the nasal cavity arising from the nasal septum, okay? It can be on the either side. And this is an endoscopic image, okay? Look here, this is the uh, inferior terminate, and here, this is the septal spur, okay? And this is a pointed projection, okay? And this will also cause obstruction, and this needs to be corrected. And because it is impacted on the lateral wall, it may result in headache as well. Now, this is uh, the thickened nasal septum and this is the impacted nasal septum. So uh, look here, maybe this was congenital, we do not know, or maybe this person suffered from some uh, septal fracture and one part of the one broken uh, septal fragment it got over the other uh, broken septal fragment and thereby uh, they resulted the thickening of the nasal septum. Okay, so this is also an anomaly. Okay, and look here. This is an impacted nasal septum. Okay, the septum lies in the midline like here, but here it has gone up to the lateral wall and it is impacted there. And these are the third turbulence. So can you, see, uh, can you see the differences between the turbulence of the both sides here? Can you? Okay, uh, of course you can appreciate it, okay? The, okay, here, this is the right side, okay, this is always the right side of the patient and this is the left side of the patient, okay? So, as you can see, in the left side of the patient, uh, you can see that uh, both the middle terminates and the inferior terminates, they are enlarged, they are hypertrophied, okay? So why this happens? Because of the normal physiology of the nose, okay, here, the space has been made smaller, okay? And so because of that, because of the DNS, there is compensatory inferior turbinate hypertrophy on the contralateral side, okay? Because there is the more space, physiologically, the inferior turbinates, it tends to grow, okay? So here you see a very big turbinate and you may feel as to surgically repair it or surgically correct it, okay? But that is not going to improve the situation because the main pathology lies here in the nasal septum. So the main pathology is to be corrected. Okay, this septum should be straightened, and this will physiologically reduce in size. 
All right, okay. So I'm sure, okay, uh, yeah, you're clear up to here. Okay. Now, C-shaped DNS, not touching lateral nasal wall, okay? So this is a diagram. This is an email from the vestibular examination here. The tip has been, okay, now, okay? The tip has been lifted and along that, can you see here? This is instrument here, okay? So this is the 3D gum, okay? The 3D gum is pressing over the medial wall and the lateral wall and the septum has been exposed, okay? So this is c -sip DNS and this is the lateral wall and it is not tossing the lateral wall. And here you can see this part, the inferior turbinate, it has grown, in, uh, grown out in size. And here it has become larger and it is tossing the lateral wall. So look at what happens is, now there is the CCF DNS and uh, it is tossing the lateral wall. So there is obstruction here. And then on the contralateral side, okay, ipsilateral and contralateral, okay. On the contralateral side, there is hypertrophy of the inferior turbinate. And again, this will cause the blockage or obstruction of the nasal cavity. And the patient will present to you is, well, okay, he will say that, okay, I'm having a difficulty in breathing. I'm having nasal blockage. But then, then you see two, two, two things, okay? Outgrown, outgrowing. One is the septum and one is the infratorbid. So the first, what you need to do is to correct the nasal septum and hopefully the infratorbid will get corrected by itself. Now, this is what I meant by compensatory turbinate hypertrophy, okay? So when there is the DNS on one side, the other turbinate is hypertrophic, okay? So this is not the septum, okay? The, this is, the septum is up to here and this is the inferior turbinate, okay? And see the inferior turbinate has grown out in size and it is nearly filling the nasal cavity, thus obstructing the airflow. Now, what are the clinical features of DNS? Okay, it's obvious there is nasal blockage. It is present on the side of DNS, okay? And there's something called the paroxysmal nasal obstruction due to compensatory inferior turbinate hypertrophy. Okay, we have already talked about this. Okay, now also recurrent fault. Okay. Okay, nose the one of the functions of nose is ventilation. Okay, but because of the blockage, the ventilation is not proper or optimum. So that will result in sinusitis. And because of the sinusitis, okay, there is a recurrence of the common cold. And similarly, there can be headache due to the contact with lateral wall and the sinusitis, there can be headache. Similarly, epistaxis, okay? So when, whenever there is uh, the deviation or the septal spur, the mucosa or the deviated part, it is stressed. And because that is stressed, there is dry crusting and bleeding on removal. And similarly, if the blood vessels, uh, they are stressed over the spur, then there is more tendency for them to bleed. Similarly, hyposmia, okay? So it is seen in the high DNS, not, not anteriorly because the olfactory epithelium is around this area, okay? So if there is a high DNS, so that will obstruct uh, the flow of the air towards the olfactory epithelium and then there will be hyposmia. And, uh, and there can also be associated external nasal deformity. Now, securely, what will happen if you have a deviated nasal septum? Okay, as I said earlier, there will be sinusitis, there will be mouth breathing because you will always uh, be required to take care inside your lungs, but if the nose is blocked, like uh, when we had in common cold, okay? So we need to do the mouth breathing, and because of the mouth breathing, there will be pharyngitis because the air that we take it from the mouth, it is not air conditioned, okay? It is not warmed, it is not humidified, it is not filtered. So we are bypassing the important function of the nozzle, which are humidification, filtration, and air conditioning, okay? Similarly, atrophic rhinitis, and subsequently, there can be meiosis. Okay, what is meiosis? We'll talk about it in the next class, okay? And there can be otitis media, okay? So there's repeated rhinitis or sinusitis will cause eustachian tube occlusion. And because of eustachian tube occlusion, there is a negative pressure in the middle ear, and ultimately there will be suppuration and otitis media of various types. 
Okay, not only in ENT, but in all subjects, all the scientists and all the pioneers, we need to remember them, okay? So I put this image, here's Gustav Killian, okay? So why, why I put uh, this image? Because uh, in next classes and later in ENT, you are going to hear this word frequently, Killian's, okay? Like Killian's curriculum, okay? And Killian's in season, okay? And many more, okay? Similar cotal, okay? In the last class or two classes earlier, I told you about Cottle's test, okay? So this is the person who devised this Cottle test. Okay, I'm sure you remember what is called the Cottle test. Okay, it is done in DNS. Okay, I have another slide there. Okay, so we'll talk about Cottle test there. So indication for septum surgery. So the person, uh, the person has DNS, okay? But not all persons who, has, who have DNS need to go for septal surgery, okay? Because uh, David's nasal septum is more of a norm than, an, than a disease, okay? It is very difficult to find a straight nasal septum in all the patients, okay? Most of people have some sort of deviations or deformity, but that is not causing any problem to them, okay? It is only when there are symptoms you manage the disease aggressively, okay? Now, if the disease is causing, if the DNA is causing nasal obstruction or sinusitis, headache and epistaxis, so it is no use, you only correct the subsequent conditions, okay? If there is a headache due to sinusitis and you only correct the sinusitis, then the patient will, all, uh, will not recover completely, okay? Since so those cases, you need to do the septal surgery. And okay, the patients who have okay, uh, deviated nose, okay, there is deformity in the nose, who want some nose job. Okay, in such patients, the cartilage or the septum also needs to be corrected along with rhinoplasty. So in the end, this becomes septo rhinoplasty, okay, where you correct the septum and also the external nose. Okay. And sometimes we need to harvest the septal cartilage is a graft material to be put somewhere else, okay? So during that time, we may need to do septal surgery. Similarly, there are surgeries like hypophysectomy and eugenectomy, where we need to operate on the contralateral side, okay? So in transseptal surgeries, and similarly in hereditary telangiectasia, also septal surgery may be required. So there are two types of uh, septal surgery that we are going to talk about and that you need to know. So one is septoplasty, septoplasty and another is SMR, submucosal so re resection, okay? So first septoplasty. Okay, look here. Okay, this is the nasal septum and the incision is given here at the caudal end of the quadrilateral cartilage, okay? So this is the free incision, okay? Suppose there has been the deviation here. So we cut here and then we elevate the flap. Okay, again though, okay, before we go deeper into the surgery, okay, let's just talk about the cotal slime. Okay, it is drawn from the frontal spine, okay, frontal nasal spine to the anterior nasal spine, okay? All of these are the minor contributors for nasal septum, okay? So deviations anterior to it can be treated by septoplasty and posterior to it, they are treated, uh, okay, by SMR or septoplasty, okay? So this is the cortex lines, okay? From the frontal spine to the internasal spine, okay? So this is an imaginary line. So when doing the surgery, uh, the flap is elevated and look here, this is the mucosal flap and this is the septum. Okay, and this is the free rail elevator, okay? Here, you can see this instrument, okay? So, why I put this image here? Because you may be asked it uh, about this in your exam too. This is Fourier's elevator, okay? And suppose this part had deviation, so this part has been corrected or this has been resected, okay? And to reset the parts, we need locks for step, okay? This can also be asked in our exam, okay? And after the surgery is done, okay, we are not going to deep, going deep into surgery. So basically, what you need to do know is, okay, Incision, incision is made and the tunnels are made, okay? The flap is elevated, okay? And the septum is separated from the flap because this mucopericondrum is very important. In any ear, nose or throat surgery, ENT surgery, 
the tissues they are very important and you try not to okay i have a message here let me have a look okay uh think so i know somebody is saying that audience slides they are not getting synchronized and slide is changing slow so are all of you having this problem if it is only one or two of you having this problem then maybe because uh, it may be the issue of internet if not uh, okay then all of it for a while before i begin talking on the next slide i think it's all the only now okay somebody saying it is all good so i'll keep it as a one like i'm skipping or shuffling between different slides i know you again they have a slide away so it doesn't make much difference right okay Okay. So here we make thumbnails, the, uh, the cartilage is uh, separated, okay? So what I was telling you is that save the tissues, do not waste the tissues, do not incise or excise of the tissues because, okay, you are going to need them later on. Suppose, okay, you take off this cartilage and along the cartilage by mistake you have taken out this part, the uh, mucopery contents. So in the end there will be what? So septal perforation, okay? So, and you don't want the patient to have another disease uh, because of a mistake, right? Free elevator and, okay, this cartilage is excised, right? And the cartilage is in a bone here. This David part is excised. And this lateral to this part, there is the mucopericondrium, right? And once you have excised it, then you reposition the mucopericondrium. The, okay, uh, the mucosal layer also, right? So that is mucopericondrium, right? So we just replace it. And after all done, so there is a chance of bleeding. So we do the interior nasal packing, okay? Layer by layer, layer by layer, okay? So we pack all the nasal cavities so as to compress so that no hematoma develops at the site of uh, incision and there is no bleeding into the nasal cavity. And we take it out after two or three days. And similarly, we can also put the outer nasal packing for support. Now, some mucosal resection, okay? So this is a little different, okay? The clean season, it is put over the nasal septum. Okay? And what are the other difference? Sometimes you'll be asked uh, the uh, difference between the septoplasty and the submucous uh, resection, okay? And this is a very common question for your uh, term exams and sometimes also the theory exams, okay? So you will ask, what is DNS? Sometimes the questions are like this. What is DNS and differentiate between uh, septoplasty and SMR? One plus, four marks, a total of five marks. Okay, so these are the differences between SMR and septoplasty and you need to remember it, okay? You can take a snap, okay, through your mobile or you can just write it down because uh, the points there is small, right? So SMR is a radical surgery. Septoplasty is a conservative surgery. It is not down below the years of 17 years. It is not down below the years of 17 years. So only after the patient has uh, attained his facial development. Right? But septoplasty can be done in as young as four years old. Right? So the name of the incision that we make here is Killian's incision and here we make a Fierce incision. So this will not create a correct interior DNS. Why? Because we are making an incision here and the interior DNS of the caudal dislocation uh, and the caudal dislocation will be bypassed, okay? So this will correct interior DNS. Here, bilateral mucopericondrium is elevated, and here it is only elevated on the one side. There is a radical removal of the cartilage, and here we only improve the inferior strip. Why only the inferior strip? I'll tell you later, okay? So we do not, we cannot combine rhinoplasty incision with SMR, but with septoplasty, we can combine the rhinoplasty incision, and ultimately, what we get is septo rhinoplasty. And in this case, SMR revision surgery is difficult, but here it is relatively easy because this is a conservative surgery. And here the cartilage graft can be harvested. Here, no cartilage graft can be harvested. 
So, because this is a radical surgery, complications are common with SMR, but with septoplasty, the complications are rare. So, okay, in ENT, there are a few basic surgeries. Like in ears, there is medulloplasty, in nose, there is septoplasty, then there is tonsillectomy. So, these are the basic ENT surgeries. Okay. Despite that, septal surgery has a lot of complications. Okay. And because nose is the exposed part of the body, so any complications may result in deformity. And if there is any deformity, then it becomes very unsightly and the person may require plastic surgery. So the commonly with any surgery, we have hemorrhage. And there can be septal hematoma. Okay, we have another slide today. We're going to talk about septal hematoma too. Okay, and then we have there can be septal abscess, okay? Then septal perforation, the saddle nose, okay? If you remove all the cartilage, okay, there is a cartilage down there, then the nose can droop, okay? Then there can be saddle nose. Similarly, columnar retraction, okay? The flapping septum, persistent deviation, nasal synechia, okay? By synechia, what we mean is, okay? The middle wall and the lateral wall, they form the grand lesions and then they become attached and they cause obstruction. Okay? Similarly, there can be cystic urinary, but rarely there can be infection. And yes, toxic shock syndrome is very common. Okay, there was a case in Kathmandu where a patient was operated uh, who underwent septoplasty, six part because of the toxic shock syndrome. Okay? So a surgery as simple as septoplasty can result in death. So you need to be very careful. Okay, so septal hematoma, all of these are complications of septal surgery, but they are also a separate disease entity. Okay, it is not necessary that septal hematoma and septal abscess always occurs in conjunction with septal surgery. They can occur as a separate disease entity in the even in the patient who, who never underwent any septal surgery. Okay, so let's talk about septal hematoma. Okay, it is the collection of blood on the perichondrium and peristium of nasal septum. Okay. So try to imagine a nasal septum. Okay, there is the cartilage and there is the perichondrium lining it. Right? You can even touch. Okay, but make sure you do not uh, rub your. Uh, very uh, very cordial because uh, the little area and that can reduce the visual bleeding. So the cause is nasal trauma, septal surgery, and bleeding disorders. What are the clinical features? Okay, so there will be bilateral nasal obstruction. There is a sense of pressure over nasal breeze. Bilaterally smooth, rounded septal swelling. On palpation, mass is soft and fluctuant. Absence of raised temperature, erythema, swelling, and tenderness of the skin over the nose. Okay, so this all of these points are important to diagnose. Okay, and sometimes, uh, you know, like septal hematoma can be confused with DNS too. But look here, this is always bilateral. Okay, and there is bilateral smooth rounded septal swelling. Okay, sometimes this septal, okay, uh, in my practice, you know. I've seen several cases, especially during my residency. Okay, the cases were uh, referred from the periphery. They were seen by the HF, and they thought that this septal swelling was a polyp or something like that. Or, and they would treat uh, they would, uh, and the patients were treated for a prolonged time with antibiotics and so many things. And when the patient came, okay, uh, the septal hematoma already became a uh, septal abscess, and then there was the necrosis of cartilage. Okay, so bilateral is smooth round septal swelling. On palpation, mass is soft and fluctuant. Okay, this is a very important point. Even you can get confused with a DNS and uh, with a hematoma, but because it is a hematoma, there must be fluctuancy. Okay. <clears throat> now look here. So this is the common presentation of septal hematoma, and first type of presentation can confuse anyone. Okay, it may there may be DNS on one side. And you may think that there is compensatory nasal, uh, you know, in fact, on the other side. But the fact is, the patient is having septal hematoma. And septal hematoma, okay, there are very few emergencies in ENT. But septal hematoma is an emergency condition. So you need to diagnose it in 
in time okay now treatment okay. if the, if uh, the hematoma is small then white wood needle aspiration if there is if it is very large like this okay do ind and then do the nasal packing on the both sides compress it compress the nasal septum so that there won't be any recurrence and then of course uh, you'll require to give systemic antibiotics okay because the abscess it can result in abscess and ultimately there can be toxic shock syndrome now complications okay because of the fibrosis there can be thickened nasal septum and if you are not able to diagnose diagnose it in time the hematoma becomes a nidus for infection and then it will become a septal abscess okay and once there is septal abscess so after some time there will be necrosis of the cartilage and then there will be the drooping of the nasal tip and also the saddle nose deformity okay the saddle nose super tip deformity and septal perforation all of this happen after the formation of abscess now septal abscess collection of pus under perichondrium and periosteum of nasal septum etiology it is mostly always secondary to infection of the septal hematoma and it can result uh, is following furuncle of the nose or the upper lip and it can also follow typhoid or measles but most commonly it uh, most commonly septal hematoma precedes uh, septal abscess now just like septal hematoma uh, septal abscess is, is also an emergency condition okay bilateral nasal obstruction with fever because the abscess skin over nose was raised and preserved with hema swelling and tenderness bilateral soft fluctuant septal swelling septal mucus are congested soft mandibular node enlarged and tender okay septal abscess okay here in the ct scan you see okay here the cartilage it has been necrosed or eroded treatment abscess is drained immediately incision is made on the most dependent part like with any abscess make the incision on the dependent part because it will help to help help, help the pus or fluids to drain uh, easily because of the gravity and if the cartilage has been necrosed you need to remove that necros cartilage because there is no benefit of it keeping that necros cartilage okay and nasal packing is done system antibodies are given for 10 days okay so what happens when they whenever there is a hematoma or abscess the perichondrium is elevated it is separated from the cartilage and thereby the cartilage loses blood supply and hence there will be necrosis now complication the most critical complication are all of this necrosis of the septal cartilage, saddle nose, supratip deformity, okay, uh, septal perforation, okay, less than one minute, one is I. Septal perforation, meningitis, okay, because this is an inflammatory condition, and then there can be cavernous sinus thrombosis. Okay, uh, students, I'm going to stop now, and then I'm again going to begin this meeting because 40 minutes has been uh, is over already. Okay, so can you can hear me now? Right. Okay, okay, let's. Okay, that was some technical problem, right? Okay, no big issue. Okay, so this is saddle nose. We have already seen this email, and this is cyanic. Yeah, probably you are hearing this word for the first time. Okay, the patient was operated on his nasal septum, but what happened? There is the granulation that resulted between the middle wall and the lateral wall, right? And then that form the synechia, okay? So synechia is also a recurrent complication of nasal surgeries because you are operating the patient for, uh, to relieve the nasal obstruction, but again, there is nasal obstruction, so this is of no use, this becomes of no use, right? So perfect nasal septum, right? This is another complication that we do not want to have. So the etiology is septal surgery, nose picking, septal cautery or ornamentation. Infection, septal abscess, and nasal irritants very co uh, very commonly. Eh? Like uh, in the movies and in the documentaries, you have seen that people uh, when they take drugs, okay, the cocaine they are uh, sniffed, right? And because of the sniffing action, okay, this can result very commonly results in 
septal perforation. Similarly, the foreign body is okay, rhinal lead and nasal meiosis. Okay, nasal meiosis are some organisms in the nasal cavity. Okay, so they can also cause septal perforation, and there are many granulomatous conditions okay, like TB, leprosy, syphilis, poisonous granulomatous metrosis that may cause septal perforation. Similarly, malignancy, and sometimes it can be idiopathic. Right. So, what are the clinical features? Okay, uh, I have seen a few cases of septal perforation, and this is very common. Okay, the patient will come to you to the OPT and tell that okay, when I'm breathing, okay, there is a whistling sound. Okay, city bots are transfer level am I? So, whenever the patient says something like that, always suspect septal perforation, right? And if the perforation is very large, there will be nasal crusting, nasal obstruction because of the crust, and if it is on the crust removal, right? Thermal resource nodules and perforations are. The nasal cavity has become larger, but it doesn't happen like that, right? There will be nasal crustings, and because of that, there will be obstruction. Right, so look here, this is what it looks like, right? The septum, it has been perforated, right? Here and here. Right, so what is the treatment? Okay, the treat the causes of septal perforation. If the, it is because of TV or simply treat them, right? If the patient is using drugs, the asymptom to st uh, stop it. And always in the uh, in nasal conditions, what we do is alkaline nasal dosing, right? So the crust are removed by nasal dosing. And if the perforation is small, then it is closed by flaps, mucosal advancement flap, okay? What it is, I'll tell you later. And if it is large, then there is a result that we can do, or we can use stylistic uh, obturator, okay, allodomes. And if sources are done, uh, the results are not very good. So, Obturator or something to cover the perforation. Okay, that is very useful. Okay, look here. If, if the perforation of this size, then what we do is we just undermine uh, the graft and the, we pull it and then we cover it. And because uh, the graft it has not uh, lost its blood supply, then there is a very good chance of healing. Okay, look here. Okay, here we have the perforation and here the mucosal flap has been advanced and it has uh, been brought up to here and it has been closed. And later on, we hope that this area will grow and the perforation will be sealed up. Right? And similarly, there is sublabial flap. Okay, our flap is taken from here and it is put there covering the perforation. And this is a silastic obturator. So it is put inside uh, the site for perforation, okay? So that is all, okay? So let us go back again to the roadmap, right? So we will be done, we'll be done here, okay? Anatomy, by now you must be aware about the anatomy already. And these are the four disease conditions, okay? The occurring in the nasal septum, and all of these are important. And these two, the middle two are very important because they are nasal emergencies or ENT emergencies. And it becomes, because they're emergencies, it becomes very important for you to diagnose them and send them to the ENT surgeon for surgical intervention. And if you're working in, in a very rural area or a very far off area, so it is always good to attempt and try to incise and drain it, right? Because if you wait or if the person has any money to travel or if the person has to spend a lot, lot of money to book a helicopter, okay? So better to operate it there so that the hematoma want to raise to abscess. So, okay, class, uh, I'll be stopping here for now, right? And